Just 15% of Americans approve of the job Congress is doing. But why is it broken and how do we fix it? Those are just two of the questions I asked Justin Amash, the former five-term congressman from Michigan who's currently exploring a Senate run. Elected as part of the Tea Party wave in 2010, Amash helped create the House Freedom Caucus, but became an increasingly lonely principled voice for limiting the size, scope, and spending of the federal government. After voting to impeach Donald Trump in 2019, he resigned from the GOP, became an independent, and joined the Libertarian Party in 2020, making him the only Libertarian to ever serve in Congress. We talked about the 2024 presidential race and the country's political and cultural polarization that seems to be growing with every passing day. We also talked about how his parents' experiences as a Christian refugee from Palestine and an immigrant from Syria inform his views on foreign policy, entrepreneurship, and American exceptionalism. This Q&A took place on the final day of LibertyCon, the annual event for Students for Liberty that was held recently in Washington, D.C. Here is the Reason interview with Justin Amash. everybody for coming out, and uh, even coming out for Justin Amash. But uh, let's give it up to him one more time, please. So the, the, the topic of this talk, and we're going to veer away from that, but let's start with why is Congress broken, and how, uh, how do we fix that? And, you know, let's give you a couple minutes on that. All right, well, we could take up the whole 30 minutes talking yeah. about that if we wanted to. Um, we don't know exactly how Congress got to where it is, but today it is highly centralized, where a few people at the top control everything. And that has a lot of negative consequences for our country. Uh, among them is that the president has an unbelievable amount of power, because the president now only has to negotiate with really a few people. You have to negotiate with the Speaker of the House, you have to negotiate with the Senate Majority Leader and maybe some of the minority leaders. But it's really a small subset of people that you have to negotiate with. And when that happens, it gives the president so much leverage. So when we talk about things like uh, going to war without authorization, well, as long as the Speaker of the House isn't going to hold the president accountable and the Senate Majority Leader is not going to, the president is just going to do what he wants to do. And when it comes to spending, as long as the president only has to negotiate with a couple people, the president's going to do whatever the president wants to do. So it's super easy in the system for the president to essentially uh, bully Congress and dictate the outcomes. But there's a, there's a deeper problem with all of this, which is representative government is supposed to be a discovery process. You elect people to represent you, you send them to Washington, and then the outcomes are supposed to be discovered by these representatives through discussions and debates and the introduction of legislation and amendments. And you're supposed to have lots of votes where you freely, you know, where the votes freely reflect your will representing the people back home. But instead, in Congress today, a few leaders are deciding what the final product is and then they're even not bringing it to the floor until they know they have the votes. So there's no actual discovery process. And Nancy Pelosi used to brag about this, like she wouldn't bring a bill to the floor unless she knew it was going to pass, right. which is the opposite of how Congress should work. So what are, briefly, what are some of the ways to kind of decentralize power within Congress? Um, you know, when you were <clears throat> in Congress, you founded the Freedom Caucus. Uh, which was supposed to be kind of a, a redoubt of people who believed in, you know, limited government and libertarian and conservative principles, and actually even some liberal principles, but decentralizing authority. You got kicked out of the Freedom Caucus, right? Well, I, I, or, I resigned from oh, it. You, well, you were asked to leave, right? It was <laughs> like the, the police sirens were coming, and it's like, hey, you know what, I'm going to go, right? But even places like that that were explicitly designed to act as a countervailing force to this unified Congress. So how can that happen? What, what can you do or what can somebody do to make that happen? Well, it, it does take people with strong will. I think that when we go to vote for our elected officials, when you go to vote for a representative, when you go to vote for a senator, 
you have to know that that person is willing to stand up to the leadership team. And if that person's not willing to break from the leadership team on a consistent basis, and this doesn't mean they have to you know, be mean or anything yeah. like that. It just Although means that's, they that's, have to be- in, that, That's an option. Right? <laughs> that's an option. Yeah. Yeah. But they just have to be independent enough where you know they're willing to break from their leadership team. And if, if they're not willing to do that, it doesn't matter how much they agree with you on the issues, don't vote for them. Because that person's gonna sell out. There's no chance they're gonna stand up for you when it counts. So I think you need to have people who have a, a strong will who are gonna go there and actually represent you and, w and are willing to stand up to the leaders. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in uh, Congressman Amash's you know, uh, commentary on, on contemporary issues, go to his Substack. you know, it's Justin Amash, and the tagline is a former congressman spills on Congress and makes the practical case for the principles of liberty. Uh, so it's on Substack. It's a great read. Um, and particularly on, on issues, you mentioned uh, kind of war uh, and things like that. And the war powers resolution, he's, it, it's great stuff. But can you tell us quickly, how did you discover libertarian ideas? And then, you know, you got elected in 2010, which was a wave election. It was the part of the Tea Party reaction to uh, eight years of Bush uh, and um, you know, more problems on, you know, during the financial crisis and the reaction of government to that. Where did you first encounter the ideas of liberty and how did that motivate you to get into Congress? Well, the, the ideas of liberty are something that have been with me since I was a child. I, um, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where they came from. I think they came from my parents' immigrant experience mm -hmm. um, coming to the United States. My dad came here as a refugee and- um, and A refugee from? Uh, from Palestine. Yeah. So he was born in Palestine in 1940. And when uh, the state of Israel was created in 48, he became a refugee. So my parent, my mom is a Syrian immigrant. So. When my parents came here, um, they weren't wealthy. My dad was a very poor refugee. I mean, he was, he was so poor that the Palestinians made fun of him. Um, so, you know, that's really poor. Um, and when he came here, he didn't have much, but he, he felt he had opportunity. He felt he had a chance to start a new life, uh, a chance to make it even though he came from a different background from a lot of people. Even though um, you know, his English wasn't great compared to a lot of people. So he came here and he worked hard and he built a business. And when we were young, he used to tell us that America is the greatest place on earth where someone can come here as a refugee like he did and start a new life and have the chance to be successful. And it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what obstacles you face. You have a chance here. And you don't have that chance in so many places around the world. So for me, I think that's where that spirit of liberty came from. It was from my dad's experience, especially my mom as well, coming here as a, a young immigrant. And, um, and so I was always a, a little bit uh, I guess anti-authoritarian as a child. Um, I rebelled against teachers at times. Uh, I didn't like arbitrary authority, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, when someone just would make up a rule, like, you know, this is the rule, I just say so. Well, tell me why, like what's the, you know. Uh, have you rethought that as a parent? Uh, no, I mean, I, I let my kids think <laughs> very freely. Okay. And um, as long as they follow the rules, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't mind when they are a little bit rebellious. Yeah. I think it, it doesn't hurt for kids to have some independence. Um, I encourage them to challenge their teachers even when they when they think the yeah. teacher's wrong about something. I, I think that it's a good thing for people to to go out there and and not just accept everything right. as it is. Yeah. So. Um, that's that kind and of you famously as a congressman explained all of your votes on Facebook, which is a rare concession by authority to say, okay, this is why I did what I did. Yeah, and and actually, you know, a lot of the people in leadership and in Congress didn't like that I was doing that yeah. because I was giving people at home the power to challenge them. Yeah. 
Um, so instead of just being told, like, this is the way it is, now I was revealing what was going on. You grew up in Michigan. You went to University of Michigan as an undergrad and for law school. Was it there that you started coming across names like Hayek and Mises and, you know, uh, Friedman, uh, Rand, Rothbard, or whoever? Not really, no. Yeah. You know, my, my background's in economics. My degree's in economics. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Uh, people love There's economics There's at least one person there. with an economics Hey, has anybody here, here ever been part of economics? <laughs> like, like, yeah. <laughs> Anyone from economics yeah. here? Yeah. All right. We'll speak slower. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so um, and I did well in economics yeah. at Michigan, but we sure didn't study... Austrian economics, right. we didn't study Hayek. Yeah. Um, I think he might have been mentioned in one class. Mm -hmm. Very briefly he was mentioned, like on, there was like one day where he was mentioned. Um, but I, I'd say that what happened is, as I went through my economics degree and then I got a law degree at Michigan as well, I started to realize that I had a lot of differences from other people who were otherwise aligned with me. You know, I was a Republican, I was, I aligned with them on a lot of things, but there were a number of issues where we didn't align. Um, some of the foreign policy issues, but certainly a lot of civil liberties issues. Mm -hmm. And I started to wonder, like, what am I? Yeah. What, you know, what's going on here? I, you know, I just thought of myself as a Republican and I would read the platform and, you know, hear what they're saying. They believe in limited government and economic freedom and individual liberty. But when push came to shove on a lot of issues, they didn't believe those things. You know, they'd say they believe those things, but they didn't. So, uh, and I've told this story before, I just typed some of my views into um, a Google search mm -hmm. and up popped Hayek's Wikipedia page. Mm. So, and the, literally it was like the top thing <laughs> on Google. So I clicked on that, started reading about him, and I was already in my, my mid-20s at this yeah. time, you know, I was, wow. you know, and, and I was like, yes, mm -hmm. this is what I believe. And do you think that full view of, of individual liberty, not just in the economic sphere, but in everything else, that's informed by your, your parents' experience, and, and also they're running a business, um, but, you know, it is interesting because you would have been coming of age during a time when the Republicans were ascendant, uh, but they were kind of the war party, and you know we were told after 9/11 that you should not speak freely. That was kind of a problem, right? Yeah, sure. And throughout my life, I've believed freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. These are uh, critical values. Um, maybe they're the essence of of everything that makes yeah. this country work. You know, the idea that we come from a lot of places. Uh, there's an incredible amount of diversity in the United States. I think diversity is always treated, or often treated like a bad word these days. But it's a blessing to our country that we have people who come from so many backgrounds. And actually, the, the principle of liberty is about utilizing that diversity. You know, it's, it's in central, centrally planned systems where diversity is not utilized where someone at the top dictates to everyone else and doesn't take advantage of any of the diversity. They, they say, no, a few of us at the top, we know everything. It doesn't matter, all of your backgrounds, all of your skills, all of your talents, that doesn't matter. What matters is we've got a few people in a room somewhere and they're gonna decide everything. Mm -hmm. And they know best because they're experts. So you came in to office in 2011 and it seemed like there was a real libertarian insurgency within the Republican Party, but more nationally in discourse. People were tired of continued centralization, government secrecy, uh, famously, uh, you know, a lot of Bush's activities and particularly war spending early on was done in supplemental and emergency preparations, not really open to, you know, full discussion and whatnot. Um, all of this stuff coming out of the Patriot Act, uh, you know, somebody like, uh, I was going to say Darth Vader, I meant Dick Cheney, uh, you know, kind of saying like, you know, we, we're in control. Uh, but then Obama also promised the, uh, the most transparent administration ever and plainly did not deliver on that. Um, but that energy pushing back on centralization and government power and government secrecy, 
seems to, you know, that helped bring you and other people like you to Congress seems to have dissipated. Do mm -hmm. you agree with that? And if so, what, what took that away? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, when I was running for office, um, both for State House mm -hmm. in 2009, when I, when I was running for, um, uh, for that office, and uh, when I got to Congress in 2011, there was a lot of energy behind a sort of a limited government, um, libertarian-ish mm. republicanism. And, and I felt like libertarianism was really rising. Um, was, there was a chance for libertarian ideals to get a lot of traction. And um, a lot of people who used to be, I guess, more like Bush conservatives were coming around to the libertarian way. So I felt really good about where things were heading. And for the first, I'd say, three or four years that I was in Congress, I felt like we continued to move in the right direction. I mean, the, the creation of the Freedom Caucus was kind of um, a, a dream of like bringing people together to challenge the leadership. They weren't all libertarians or anything like that. I mean, there were a few who were libertarian-leaning. But the idea that a group of uh, Republican members, probably, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, determined that it was going to be only Republicans, but it ended up being Republicans, that Republican members got together and said, hey, we're going to challenge the status quo, we're going to challenge the establishment. Um, that was a kind of a dream that it had come together. And then... Uh, when Donald Trump came on the scene, I think a lot of that just mm. fell apart uh, because he's, he's such a strong personality and character um, and had so much of a hold over a lot of the public, right. uh, especially on the Republican side, that it was very hard for um, my colleagues to, to be willing what do, to challenge him. What do you think the essence, there's been a lot of, discussion this weekend about the threat of things like national conservatism or Trump, Trumpist populism on the right, woke progressivism on the left. Maybe we'll get to that in a second. But what's the essential appeal of Trump? Um, is it his actual, is it his personality? Is it that he said he could win and he ended up doing that at least once? Um, is it a cult of personality? Is it the idea he's in charge? I, you know, what, what's the core of his... Uh, his appeal to you? Think? Well, I think he's definitely a unique character. Yeah. Uh, he has a, a certain charisma that is probably unmatched in politics. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen someone who campaigns as effectively as he does. It doesn't mean you have to agree with, you know, all yeah. of the ethics of what he does or any of that um, or, or the substance. But I think to that... To keep it in Michigan, he's a rock star. He's an Iggy Pop. Yeah, you may not he, like he, what he's doing on the stage, but you can't take your eyes off it. That's right. He, he holds court. You know, like when he's out there, people pay attention. Um, and he really understands the essence of campaigning, how to win a campaign. He understands how to effectively go after opponents. Now, again, I'm not saying that all of these things are necessarily ethical or that other people should do the same things, but... Um, but he really understands how to lead a populist movement. Yeah. And how, how important do you think in his appeal is a, a politics of resentment that, you know, somehow he is going to get back what was taken from you unfairly? Well, I mean, the, the whole make America great again. Yeah. There's, a, there's a whole idea there of someone is destroying your life and I'm going to get it back for you. And um, that's a very powerful thing to a lot of people. For, for a lot of uh, people out there, it is more important to get back at others than necessarily to have some kind of vision of, of how this is all going to work um, going forward. Uh, it, it's not appealing to me because I understand we live in one country, we have uh, people of all sorts of backgrounds, and if you're going to persuade people, um, you have to be able to live with them and work with them regardless of your differences. It doesn't mean that you can't um, be upset, be angry about what some other people are doing or saying, but um, there has to be an effort to, to live together here as, as one country. We have too much in common in this country.
What um, you, Michigan was a, was a massive swing state when he won election. Um, you voted to impeach Donald Trump. What went into that calculation and then what was it, what was the reaction like to that? Because that, you know, that's a profile in courage. Well, I don't think that's like, you know, I don't think that's my most courageous vote, not even by a long shot. What, what I was wanna, it? Well, Naming the I post don't... office after your father, or? <laughs> I didn't, yeah, didn't name yeah. any post offices yeah. after my father, to be clear. Um, so, I think that the courageous votes are the ones where everyone is against you. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just like, uh, you know, one party. It's, it's one thing to vote for impeachment and like half the country loves what you did and half the country doesn't like what you did. That's, in my mind, not that challenging or difficult. Uh, it's when you take a vote and you know that 99% of the public is going to misconstrue this, misunderstand it, be against it. The vote is gonna be something like, um, you know, 433 to one in the House or something like that. Those are the tough votes. Yeah. Hmm. And there are plenty of those votes out there uh, where you're taking a principled stand and you're doing it to protect people's rights. Hmm. But it's not the, the yeah. typical narrative. What, so those was, are. Yeah, is there an example that in your uh, legislative record that you would put forth for that? Well, I mean, one of the ones I, I've talked about before is they, they tried to pass some anti lynching legislation at the federal level, and we're, everyone's against lynching, obviously. But the legislation itself was bad and would actually harm a lot of people, including harming a lot of black Americans. So, like, there was. This idea that this legislation was good was just, you know, yeah. parroted by a lot of people in the media. They didn't read the legislation. And in fact, I complained about it, and it mysteriously did not pass both houses that Congress after I pointed out all the problems with it. It did pass the House of Representatives, did not pass um, both houses and get signed by the president. And um, mysteriously, the next Congress they reintroduced it and rewrote it in a way that took into consideration all of my complaints. Mm -hmm. And they tried to pass it off like they were just reintroducing the same legislation. And I pointed out, hey, they actually, you know, yep. they actually saw that there was a problem here and then tried to pretend like, oh, we're just passing it again. Th those kind of votes are tough because when you take the vote, you know, everyone thinks you're wrong. Right. Everyone. And you have to go home and you have to explain it. Yeah. And um, those are the ones that are tricky. It, back to the impeachment point. Look, I'd impeach every president. <laughs> um, let's be, <laughs> let's, let's be clear. Now, I'm not the kind of person who's going to introduce impeachment legislation, you know, over every uh, thing that a president does wrong. When you introduce legislation to impeach a president, you have to have some backing for it. It can't just be, you know, one person saying, let's impeach. For example, I would definitely impeach President Biden over these unconstitutional wars, mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. But the idea of introducing impeachment legislation suggests there's other people who will join you. Otherwise, it's just an exercise in futility. Right. You know, you introduce it, it doesn't go anywhere, it just sits there. Um, if we're gonna impeach people, there has to be some yep. public backing, which is why I try to make the case all the time for these impeachable offenses, why they should, why some legislation mm -hmm. should be brought forth. Yep. But you've gotta get the public behind you on that kind of stuff. But yeah, you sh I think that every president should be impeached, <laughs> every recent president at least. If the, if Trump uh, populism, national conservatism is, and a politics of resentment is sucking up a lot of energy on the right. How do you feel about, or like, how do we deal with the rise of identity politics and a kind of woke progressivism on the left? Um, where is that coming from and, and what is the best way to combat that? I think a lot of it is just repackaged socialist ideas, collectivist ideas. Um, the idea of equity, for example, is really like a perversion of the idea of equality. In, in most respects, when people say equity, they mean the opposite of equality. 
It means you're going to have the government or some central authority decide what the outcome should be, how much each person should have, rather than some system of equality before the law, where the government is not some kind of arbiter of who deserves what. And when you think about it, there is no way for the government to do this. There's no way for the government to properly assess all of our lives. This is, in many ways, the, the point of diversity is like we all ha we're all so different and there's no way that a central authority can decide how to manage all that. Um, so for many of the people on the woke left who say they care about diversity, they don't care about diversity if they're talking about equity. These things are in conflict with each other. The idea that you're gonna decide that someone is more deserving than another based on some um, superficial characteristics. As an example, um, I've talked about this, and I've talked about this earlier in this conversation. My dad came here with nothing as a poor refugee. Yet, in a lot of cases, he might be classified as just a, you know, a white American even though he came here as an extremely poor Palestinian refugee. Um, the New York, New York Times, for example, classifies me as white. They might classify someone else who's Middle Eastern as a person well, of color. they actually and, did, right, with and so, Tlaib. So I think a lot of this is just someone is making decisions at the top, saying, well, we think this person is more like this or that, and we're going to decide they're more deserving. But they don't know our backgrounds. They don't know anything about us. They don't know who deserves this or who deserves that. And no central authority could figure that out. So the best thing we can do is have a system of equality before the law, where the law treats everyone the same. It doesn't give an advantage to any person over another person. And it may not be fair in some sense to some people. Some people may say, well, that's not fair. You know, some people, instead of having a dad who's a Palestinian refugee, their dad was some, you know, Silicon Valley billionaire. Mm -hmm. Some person might have a dad who was a professor. Another person might have a dad who worked at a fast food restaurant. You just, you don't know what the, the differences are. We can't, the government can't figure all of this out and say, who is more deserving yeah. than someone else? So, uh, I really think that the, the woke left, when they push this idea of equity, they're really pushing against diversity. They're saying, we're gonna decide, a few people at the top are gonna decide who's valuable and who's not valuable. And they're not gonna actually take into consideration any of our differences because no central authority could take it into consideration. You, you are a libertarian, not an anarchist. You believe there is a role for government, but it should be obviously much more limited. You're also, Although that's a complicated topic, but I could write a whole yeah. book about that. Uh, we would love to read that book. Um, you are also an Orthodox Christian. Could you talk a little bit about how in a world of limited government, a libertarian world, the government wouldn't be doing everything for everybody, but places, think, organizations and the institutions like the church or other types of intervening, countervailing, mediating institutions would help to fill the, the gaps that are left by government. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, that's the, that's the place for these organizations is to help in society, not to have government deciding it. And again, when you have some central authority deciding it, you are really limiting the opportunities for the public. You're limiting um, the opportunities for assisting people. You're deciding that a few people are going to make all the decisions rather than having a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals making decisions. When you centralize it all, there are a lot of people who are going to be missed, a lot of people who are going to be ignored. When you let the marketplace work this out, when you let private organizations work this out, there is a lot more opportunity for people who need help to get help. And, uh, and I think that's really important. Um, we're running out of time, but I want to ask, um, to go back to this question of there, there was a libertarian wave. I, I like to call it a libertarian moment, which I think we're still living in, but we don't understand. 
rhetoric aside. There's been what, a pause. Yeah, okay. Uh, what, um, what are the best ways to um, kind of get libertarian ideas and sensibilities in front of young people to really energize the coming, you know, you're a millennial, uh, the, uh, you know, and Gen Z, like the world is getting young again. And how do we make sure that these people are hearing and understanding and maybe being persuaded by libertarian ideas? Well, for one thing, we have to meet them where they are. I spend a lot of time, for example, asking my kids uh, which social media kids use these days. Um, Exclusively you know, Pornhub, yeah. in my experience. <laughs> they're, they're in a lot of places that the adults aren't. So we might be on Facebook. I mean, the, you know, my generation, your generation, other people are on, on X or Twitter. Um, and there are other people on TikTok. And so, like, you have to meet them where they are. And if, if they're not on X, and it's still weird talk, calling yeah. it X. Um, if they're not on X and you are, well, they're not hearing your message. So that's an issue. And that's something we all have to, to work on. You know, I'm probably reaching primarily... Um, Gen X and millennial mm -hmm. people on X, and I'm, I'm probably not reaching Gen Z people as well. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to work on getting them in those places. Okay. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, I think people who have libertarian instincts, people who, who, are, who want to present libertarianism and are in, have an opportunity, go speak to students at schools. I used to do this as a member of Congress, um, I used that opportunity as much as I could. When schools would invite me, I'd, I'd say yes, I'd be happy to come to the school to speak to the students and take all their questions and be open about being a libertarian. Mm -hmm. Tell them frankly that your philosophy is libertarianism and, and talk to them about it. I think it's great. A lot of teachers end up surprised. They walk away saying, I've had many teachers walk up to me and say like, whisper to me, I think I'm a libertarian too. <laughs> you know, after having the conversation, because they have stereotypes about what it might mean to be a libertarian, and um, you have the opportunity to change their mind. Uh, final question. I have seen a lot of chatter. I have actually helped publish a lot of chatter that you may be running for the U.S. Senate from the eh, mediocre state of Michigan. Um, do you have an announcement? Go, go blue. Yeah. Do you have an announcement that you would like to make? So, uh, as a part of the... Um, national championship uh, winning state of Michigan uh, this year. Yeah. Um, I, I am exploring a run for Senate. Mm -hmm. I, the, the FEC requires me to state that I am not a candidate mm -hmm. for Senate, um, but I am exploring uh, a run for Senate. And um, if you're interested in and in checking it out, go to exploratory.justinamash.com. Um, and uh, I'm giving it serious thought. I, I think that there is an opportunity for uh, libertarians this year, and there's an opportunity to win a Republican Senate seat this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at the Republican primary, and um, I think this is probably the best shot libertarians have had in a long time in the state of Michigan. All right. Thank you very much, Justin Amash. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone.